Today we're here to talk about Code Better with Einstein for Developers and Code Analyzer. My name is Ananya, joining me today is John, and today we'll take you through a whirlwind tour of the current issues that we've heard from a lot of our Salesforce developers. We'll take a look at Jake, Salesforce developer in action today, and see how he's able to seamlessly tie together all of our different developer tools with the help of generative AI to be more productive as he builds on top of the platform. So let's get started. Like any Salesforce presentation, we want to make sure that you make all of your purchasing decisions based off of publicly available information. So again, I want to take a moment to say thank you to all of you. As Salesforce developers, the feedback that you provide us makes the lives of PMs like me and John a lot easier. We want to make sure that everything that we prioritize on our roadmap is actually solving pain points that y'all face on a day to day. So thank you for the feedback and keep it coming. I've got another forward looking statement, okay. So as I mentioned earlier, my name is Ananya and I'm your PM for your IDE experience, which is a Salesforce extension pack, and now Einstein for developers as well. Joining me is John. Yeah, I am John Bello. I'm the product manager for Salesforce Code Analyzer. Awesome. So let's take a moment to kind of understand where most of our Salesforce developers are at today. We've heard from you all that we have a ton of different tools that we provide you with across the platform. And a lot of times, it gets really difficult to understand which tool you're supposed to be using for which task. So you end up switching between different tools and workspaces based off of the specific tasks that you're working on. And along the same lines, as we release new features in Apex and LWC, the best practices and guidance that we advise you all with continues to evolve. And in the backdrop of all of this, we also have the fact that the tasks that you all are actually tasked to do continue to increase. And so you end up in a place where you've got a lot of work and you're still trying to figure out which tools you're supposed to use for which task. Now I realize I painted a pretty bleak picture there, but luckily you have John and myself here today to show you how to seamlessly integrate all of the different Salesforce developer tools throughout your developer life cycle and help you be more productive using AI. So let's take a look at what Jake is working on today. We're going to start off in the coding and testing phase for Jake. He is going to be working inside of our eBikes project, and he wants to get started with his initial task of the day. For his task today, he has been told that he needs to add in some new functionality to our product controller within eBikes. And of course, we want to make sure that Jake has the ability to complete these tasks from anywhere. And so everything we'll be talking about today is going to be available to you in both VS Code and Code Builder, which means that you can utilize this on your desktop and inside of your browser. And along the way, we want to see how Jake is able to leverage Einstein for developers and Code Analyzer to complete his tasks within the coding and testing portions of his development lifecycle. So why don't we see all of this in action with a demo? So let's pretend that today I am Jake, and I have opened up Code Builder, and I'm ready to go. I've got my eBikes project loaded in here, but what I really want to do is also make sure that I have Einstein for developers installed and active. So the first thing I'll do is move over to my VS Code Marketplace, where I can quickly see that I have Einstein for developers installed. The next way that you can also make sure that you have this actively enabled is using our status menu icon. Status menu icon is great because it'll give you a quick look into whether Einstein is currently active, and if you click on it, you open up a really handle, handy status menu. From this menu, again, you can see what the current state is, and you have the option of really configuring that environment. So you can disable certain features as you choose, you can update your keyboard shortcuts and your settings, and then of course, you have getting started walkthroughs and documentation to learn more. Now luckily, Jake is an expert, and so we don't need to get deep into our documentation. We'll just go ahead and get started with our task for the day. So the first thing I'm gonna do is move into my product controller class. Earlier today, I spent some time as Jake writing out my get products method. 
Now, the next few things that I've been told to do is figure out what my most expensive product is and also figure out what those similar products are. Now, usually, I would have had to do all of these tasks by myself, but today, I'm going to use Einstein to help me get started. So the first thing I'll do is open up my Einstein sidebar. Within the Einstein sidebar, you can use natural language instructions to specify the task that you're looking to complete. And this is essentially the prompt that we're feeding to our large language model behind the scenes. Now, there's a few things you want to make sure that you do within your prompt. We want to make sure, first, that you are actually including all of those best practices that you'd like to see followed. So in this case, I want to make sure that my new method has an Aura-enabled annotation so it can be called from a Lightning Web component. I'm also going to specify the name of the method itself. So in this case, that is get top products. Awesome. Now the next few tips revolve around how we provide additional context to that large language model to ensure that it's giving me responses that are actually relevant to the task that I'm looking to do today. So the first piece that you'll do is make sure that you have files open within your editor that are relevant to the task that you're completing. In this case, everything I'm working on is really closely tied to that product controller. So I have my product controller class open. Again, if you have any other open tabs within your editor, we'll be taking a look at that additional context and feeding it to our LLM to make sure that the responses are contextually relevant. Now, the next piece revolves around how do we make sure that our responses are correctly referencing the metadata that I'm expecting to see. So in the Salesforce case, you have custom objects, you have standard objects, all of that goodness. Today, what I want to see within my responses is the fields from my product custom object being accurately referenced. And so I've included the API name for product custom object within the prompt itself. This is really important, again, because our LLM is going to take a look at any of these specific references to metadata within the prompt to then determine what metadata to feed alongside your prompt to our LLM. So we've done the first task. We've specified that custom object that we're working with, product. But how do we make sure that our LLM actually has that relevant schema? So in this case, the fields that I'm expecting to see referenced. Well, you're going to do that using our refresh s object definitions command. With this command, you're pulling down the schema for all of those custom and standard objects to your local workspace so that as we determine that, hey, my product custom object was referenced here, in my responses, I'm actually seeing the correct fields as well. So as you can see, once I've hit ask, I am seeing that my MSRP custom field is being accurately referenced. So just like that, I was able to complete one of my first tasks figuring out what my top product is. So we'll go ahead, add that into our file as we see, and we always recommend that you have a human in the loop to review any AI-generated code. In this case, I'm going to be declaring the list return type in a slightly different way, so I've made that edit myself, and we're pretty much ready to go with my next task. Well, my next task today is to figure out what my similar products are. I actually have an idea of how I might start this method off, so I'm gonna go ahead and use my usual Aura-enabled annotation snippet within the IDE to get started. So I've added in my snippet, and I'm gonna go ahead and start updating that method description to actually return a list of product custom objects again, and then we'll update that method name to actually be get similar products. Now, as I start typing out the method parameters, what I'm seeing, super helpful here, is that Einstein is actually auto-completing my method parameters and the method body itself. And if I keep hitting tab, I'll see the remainder of that method body quickly being auto-completed. And the great thing here, again, is that we're accurately seeing those custom fields, again, being referenced from that custom object, which is product. So awesome. I'll go ahead, keep hitting tab until I've reached a good stopping place. And I think, you know what, in this case, this method looks good. I don't need that additional try-catch block that came with the annotation. So I'll go ahead and delete that for now. 
What I'm really excited about is the fact that our logic to determine what a similar product is was actually correctly introduced via autocomplete. Super exciting, and with the help of Einstein, I'm already able to complete both of my initial tasks. Now, you would think I'm ready to move on to my next task, which, as any good developer, is writing test cases. But, as I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that you take a moment to review the code for best practices. Now, although I've reviewed the code myself, it is quite possible that I missed something or Jake missed something. And so luckily, we have our new code analyzer integration within the IDE, where I can very easily use my right-click context menu to run a scan with the help of Code Analyzer. Thank you, John and team. Behind the scenes, Code Analyzer is using our Apex PMD engine, again, to complete that static analysis scan and make sure that we're following those best practices. Turns out I missed something in the first method I created, and I didn't actually use that security-enforced mode. So I'll go ahead, make that quick edit by myself, and I'll again use the helpful in-editor IntelliSense to finish that up, and then we'll move ahead to just scanning this file one more time and making sure that we don't have any more issues. So I am, again, expecting to see that all of this goes smoothly. And my next task that I'm going to want to do is actually generate a test. As many developers face this, we know that generating tests is super important. You always want to make sure that you have tests associated with any of the t uh, methods that you're creating. Well, oftentimes, creating that test is the most difficult part of my job. It takes a lot of time. But now, with the help of Einstein, I can use my really helpful Einstein generate a test command to actually get started with writing that test itself. So now again, from that right-click context menu, I've hit generate a test. I'm gonna specify the file that I'd like to see that test being added to. I already had a test product controller. And now, this is a really important step. You wanna make sure that you're specifying any existing test methods that have that are actually testing anything similar to what I am about to do. This is important to make sure that Einstein doesn't duplicate any of the existing tests you already have. So because I specified that, I was able to see that now Einstein has created a new test method for me that's testing a totally different use case. This is great. I will definitely come back and review this further for accuracy, but for now, I think I'm ready to go. Now again, we do recommend that you always use a tool like Prettier to make sure that you're following all of those formatting best practices. And just like that, I was able to get started with and complete my tasks where I was looking to figure out what all of my top products are, figure out what my similar products are, and generate a test with the help of Code Builder, Code Analyzer, Einstein for Developers, and the Salesforce Extension Pack. So a ton of different tools that we just saw in action. And again, with Code Builder, you get access to that web-based browser experience and the Salesforce extension pack already pre-bundled for you. With Einstein for Developers, we got a chance to see natural language to code, code auto-completion, and test case generation. And last but not least, we were able to validate all of that AI-generated code with the help of Code Analyzer as well. So again, for y'all who aren't familiar, Code Builder is now currently in GA. It went GA around Dreamforce of last year and is really quick and easy for you to spin up. It comes pre-bundled with your Salesforce extension pack and Salesforce CLI, so you don't have to worry about installing any of those developer tools by yourself. We also got to see Einstein for Developers in action. I'm super excited to announce that just this Monday, our team's both within platform and AI research, recently released our newest capabilities, which include test case generation for Apex and inline auto-completion for Apex and LWC, JavaScript and CSS files specifically for now. Earlier last year at Dreamforce, you got to see the natural language of code generation experience being launched, and we saw a quick update to that one as well. And again, another exciting update is to our data usage policy. We are not using any customer data to train our internal models here at Salesforce. So what's happening behind the scenes? 
I've been mentioning a few times now that we're using generative AI. Well, the model that we're actually working with was built by our very own in-house AI research team, and it's called CodeGen. CodeGen is Salesforce's very first large language model. We're using a version of CodeGen that has been optimized for the Salesforce use cases. So it's been trained on Apex and LWC code specifically to really focus on those Salesforce languages. And there's a few different reasons that we've chosen to work with this in-house LLM. First up is, as I mentioned, we're making sure that this large language model has been trained for the specific use cases that you all have. For example, we made sure to train our model to really support that Apex test case generation use case that we just saw in action. And similarly, we've done the same across both Apex and LWC. Now second is the fact that when you're working with our in-house LLM, we're ensuring that none of your data is ever leaving those Salesforce trust boundaries. So your data is never hitting any third-party service, it's going ahead and staying within Salesforce, and we are not using any of that data to actually train our models either. Now last but not least, we know that at Salesforce, it's really important that we're sustainable in how we go about designing our products. And so we're making sure that we choose the right model for the right task. This means that we're using a smaller model for inline autocomplete, since it is a much faster latency use case, and we'll be using a larger model for those natural language code generation capabilities where you're expecting to see larger blocks of code being generated. This helps us make sure that our sustainability footprint is small. Now, how does this all work actually behind the scenes? I mentioned during the demo how we're using different types of context to really enhance the prompt and make sure that the responses that you're getting are contextually relevant. So let's dive into how this works. You first, as a developer, in this case Jake, are going into your IDE and you're specifying that prompt with which you're expecting to see that response being generated. Once I've gone ahead and specified that prompt, I'm then actually taking into account different pieces of context from within the editor. For natural language of code generation specifically, I'm looking, again, at that metadata schema based off of what I included within the prompt. I'm also looking at any active open files within the editor. The skeleton of that file is then taken and sent to our LLM alongside the prompt to make sure that the generated response doesn't duplicate any code and is relevant, again, to the task that I'm looking to complete. So once we have that entirely bundled prompt, we send it to CodeGen, our LLM. Now, anytime we send data to CodeGen, before it's presented back to the user, we're also sending it through our trust layer. This ensures that we're filtering any output for toxic content, we're removing any PII or secrets, and overall ensuring that the code that you're submitting to us and the code that is coming out in response is actually safe and approved by Salesforce. Now, once we've gone through that entire pipeline, that code is then presented to the user within your IDE itself. And again, I covered a few different tips on how to write those prompts super effectively during the demo. I recommend you take a quick screenshot of this slide if you want to retain those tips moving forward. I will pause because I see a lot of phones going up. Awesome. And again, most important part about writing these prompts is making sure that you really capture all that information you're looking to see generated by the output. Cool. So now the most exciting part, what's coming next for Einstein for developers? Well, we've been hard at work crafting this roadmap based off of the feedback that you all have provided throughout our pilot and open beta stages. One of the big next features we'll be looking at is code explanations. We've heard from many of you all that oftentimes you're working inside of code bases that the original authors are no longer around, or maybe you're just exploring a part of the code base you're not as familiar with. Our goal is to help make that process a bit easier for you. We want to make sure that as you onboard onto these new projects, you have these code explanations, which will allow you to understand the logic behind the code, the structure, why any certain implementation decisions are made, and how you can go about integrating that code to the rest of your project with the help of code explanations. Next up, 
we have retrieval augmented generation. As you might have realized, one of the really important parts about working with AI is making sure that it has all of the right context to give you the responses that you're expecting. We're going to be enhancing our context building techniques beyond what I just described today with the help of retrieval augmented generation. So we'll have a much better understanding of all of that metadata schema within your org and your local code base files. Next up is one of my favorites, multi-turn chat. We've heard from many of you all that there's a few different things that you'd like to see solved. A lot of times when you're working with natural language to code, you want the ability to kind of iterate over your prompts and refine the response that you get from the LLM. With multi-turn chat, you'll be able to do that. And we've heard from many of you that you're not always generating net new code. A lot of times you're editing existing code within your projects or you're refactoring code within your projects. Within this chat interface, we'll be building in capabilities to make those tasks a bit easier for you as well. And last but not least is one of my personal favorites. A lot of times when I get started with building something on the platform, it just takes me a while because I have to hunt through all this documentation to really figure out which APIs I should be using and which tools I'm trying to incorporate. We want to make that task easier for you with the help of this chat interface, through which you'll be able to quickly ask questions about Salesforce documentation, APIs, best practices, without needing to go search through all that documentation yourself. Now, last but not least, if you're like me and the real estate space within your editor is valuable and you don't want to have that sidebar open all the time, we will be introducing the inline chat capabilities. So now you can stay in the flow of your work and still interact with Einstein with our new inline chat interface. Awesome. So if all this sounded really exciting for you, I want to take a moment to let you all scan another QR code where we want to get feedback from you all on our upcoming roadmap. I won't ask you all to fill this out right now, but please take a moment to scan this and fill out our Google form where we are looking to get some more feedback on our upcoming priorities. This is your chance to help make sure that we're solving your pain points. All right. So now with that, I'll hand it over to John, who's going to move on to Jake's next phase of his development life cycle. Yes, I will, Ananya. And can I just get a quick round of applause for the work Ananya's team is doing on Einstein for Developer? This is, I think this is awesome, and so do Jake's team. I mean, Jake's team is super excited to get their hands on Einstein for Developers. They're going to be more productive than ever. And they need to get going with building that e-commerce application and ultimately selling those e-bikes. However, they still have memories of their previous project where things actually did not go so well. Ultimately, there were breaking issues in production that should not have happened. They should have actually identified those issues way before they happened in their production environment. And this new project is high stakes. They, they need to really avoid that from happening. They need to introduce best practices. They need to follow DevOps. They need to use source control, all of the things that they did not use before. And they, did, they need to do this within the context of having to collaborate not only with people like Shake, pro code developers, but also local developers, declarative developers, admins that are all part of the team that is building the uh, e commerce application to ultimately sell those e bikes. So, they need to implement quality gates to ensure that their code is scanned earlier and often for any problems all the way to production. So Jake's team are going to turn into Code Analyzer to help with this problem. Code Analyzer is our open source solution that allows people like Jake to identify problems earlier in code, as we saw earlier in, uh, in Ananias demo. And Jake's team are particularly concerned with identifying code styling issues in code. They want to make sure that if a developer looks at a piece of code they've never looked at before, they can easily understand it, and they can easily fix any particular issues. But beyond that, Code Analyzer also helps them ensure that code is performant, code is secure, code follows best practices, is not prone to errors, and is not overly complex, ultimately can be refactored, can be easily maintained going forward. So with that in mind, I want to walk you guys through how Jake's team have set themselves, set themselves up for success to use Code Analyzer as part of their uh, DevOps process. So first of all, let's look at the application that, uh, that they are building. This is an example of, of an internal facing part of the solution where I can go ahead and select 
select some bikes. I can change some filters there on the left to, to get different uh, lists of different bikes that meet certain, certain criteria. And all of this is powered precisely by the, by the class that Anania was showing you earlier. Within that class, we have the get products me method that we already mentioned earlier as well. And this is what Jake has been working on. And he wants to actually introduce this change as part of his uh, development process into the developer sandbox that we just saw where the application is currently running. To do that, they've configured DevOps Center, our solution for change management and release management within Salesforce. So they've set up a pipeline where all the work takes place here on the left in, in developer sandboxes. They have additional sandboxes to cover integration where all of these work items ultimately get merged together ahead of moving on to the next, next steps around UAT and staging, and then all the way up to production as we see there on the left. So Jake has already submitted that change. He created that as part of a work item here in, uh, in DevOps Center. This last one here, get related products. And what he's done is that he committed this, this change into DevOps Center, and now he needs to go ahead and create a review so that we can actually ensure that that code is fit for purpose ahead of being moved to the integration environment. I'll go ahead and click that review, and that ultimately starts the process in the source control that, uh, that is being used, which is uh, GitHub. So I'll just go here and refresh my screen to check whether there are any pull requests coming in from DevOps Center, and I'll see one here. I'll click here, and you'll see that what is happening as part of this uh, automation that, uh, that the GitHub Action is performing is that we have a workflow that is triggering Salesforce Code Analyzer. So I'm going to click here in Details and figure out what is actually happening there. See that there's a whole bunch of steps that are taking place as part of this workflow. This will actually take a couple of minutes. So what I will do while this runs is to show you how this workflow is actually set up so you can actually use it as part of your process going forward. So there's this uh, YAML file here that provides a lot more detail on uh, how that, that GitHub workflow actually works. You'll see that what I've done is to configure my workflow to run upon a pull request across our staging, integration, UAT, and main environments. And what's happening is that this GitHub action basically check out, checks out the change that uh, Jake is trying to introduce. It installs the Salesforce CLI. On top of that, it installs the Salesforce Code Analyzer CLI plugin, and then runs a GitHub action that we just released last month for Salesforce Code Analyzer to be easily integrated into this GitHub workflow. And specifically, we are ensuring that it is scanning code for any code styling issues. Those code styling issues are being marked as severity one if they come through. And if that happens, this process will actually fail and it will not allow that particular uh, pull request to succeed. So if I go back here, that one might still be running, but I have an example here of one where it, where it just ended up failing as well. And you'll see that it will just cancel and prevent that, that pull request from happening. I can get more details by, by looking at the Actions tab here in, um, in GitHub. I can click here, and you'll see the results that the GitHub Action actually provides. So it not only creates an artifact that contains in detail all the Salesforce Code Analyzer results, but also a quick HTML summary of where I have a problem in code that I need to resolve here. It's basically saying that there's a, an issue in line 40 of my code, of my product controller class that you guys saw earlier, around the fact that I have multiple variables being declared in the same line, which goes against this particular best practice that uh, Jake's team is trying to avoid. So I'll go here, back to my code builder, and I'll actually see in line 40 that particular problem there. I'm going to go ahead and actually fix it. So I'll just uh, add these, uh, these things here. Mm, and then just copy paste. Well, there we go. Uh, and add my criteria as well. And what I'll do then, because I'm in Code Builder, which is also one of our Code Analyzer experiences, I'll just go ahead and scan my code before I submit it again back to DevOps Center. So I'll just run my scan. Code Analyzer starts there in the bottom right. Code Analyzer is, is analyzing targets. And what's going to happen, hopefully, is that we will have fixed this particular issue. And therefore, I'm in, now in a good position to submit my code back to, uh, to DevOps Center. So there you go. Scan complete. No issues. I'll go ahead and right click. Deploy my source to the org, the developer environment that, uh, that Jake is working against. 
I'll give you an example of what would happen then. We would go to our work items here. This work item would have passed the pull request. It is now ready to promote. And for me to do that, I just need to go back to my pipeline. I'll select that work item, promote selected, and then it makes its way formally into the integration environment where it is actually merged. So that process begins once I click the promote button here. And it keeps on going. Ultimately, this will get merged in a, in a second. With that in mind, I think that's, that's it for, for my demo. Let me go back to the slides and tell you a little bit more of what's happening. So we saw DevOps Center being used to set up a project pipeline to ensure that uh, there are multiple stages that changes need to go through before they actually make all the way to, to the production environment. We saw the process of actually promoting a work item provided it met our code quality criteria. And to ensure that code did meet that qual code quality criteria, we are using our new code analyzer GitHub Action that scans code for vulnerabilities. It blocks work items from being promoted if they do not meet that criteria, and also provides a summary report that can be easily used to ensure my code is, is fit for purpose and I can easily identify where the issue that I need to fix might be. I also use Code Analyzer within Code Builder again to fix the code styling problem that I found. And as Code Analyzer is available in all of the, the core developer experiences at Salesforce, I can easily use it throughout my entire development workflow. We looked at DevOps Center, our tool to, uh, to manage change and, and release management for all the Salesforce developers, enabling you through a modern UI to, to track these changes. We also saw the, that it can uh, integrate easily with GitHub, allowing you to leverage advanced features such as uh, GitHub workflows, GitHub actions, and ultimately integrate with tools such as Salesforce Code Analyzer and also many others available in the GitHub marketplace. Through a point and click, you can easily move changes as I, as I just showed you in the demo today. And we can bring in together people like Jake, so pro code, advanced developers, with declarative developers, with admins. All of those changes can be brought together, automatically detected within DevOps Center, and promoted across the various environments and all the way up to production. We saw Codeanalyzer, a free scanner that unifies many open source engines out there into a unified experience that is super easy to integrate as part of your development process. It comes with over 200 rules to allow you to detect problems a whole, across a whole range of categories. And as part of our engines, we, Salesforce, have created our own graph engine, which allows you to detect even more advanced problems in code. Most of the engines within Code Analyzer follow a pattern which we call the static code analysis, or effectively trying to look at the particular file and trying to identify issues in that particular file, certain patterns or anti-patterns. With Graph Engine, we actually simulate the entire uh, code base and the various code paths that code can run through, and that allows us to detect much more advanced vulnerabilities in terms of security and performance issues that span multiple files, multiple instances of code, and so on. Codeanalyzer is the tool that allows you to shift code quality left as part of your development process across the ID, the CLI, and CI/CD experiences. We looked at our GitHub action released last month. First time that we can actually properly bring DevOps Center together with with Codeanalyzer through using that, that particular GitHub action. However, for those of you that might not be using uh, DevOps Center, you, you can just take your CI CD tool. If you happen to be using GitHub, you can still use that GitHub action there. Or if you're not using GitHub, because Codeanalyzer is available through CLI, you can easily use the Salesforce CLI to integrate it as part of your workflow too. As for the GitHub action, it is super easy to configure and integrate as, as I showed you earlier. It, provides you with a summary report and provides you with an artifact that you can then use in subsequent steps of your workflow. To get started with our GitHub action, just go ahead, scan the QR code, read our documents, and just configure your workflow. And it's pretty much ready to go as soon as you do that. I'll give you a second there. All right. And just to wrap things up, What's coming to Code Analyzer? Well, next week we are actually releasing a preview version of our PMD engine. PMD is one of our key engines created by the open source community, and it is used by developers today to scan Apex code, Visual Force code, XML files, even for problems. With PMD7, 
we are effectively upgrading our, our Apex parser to support more recent Apex features, such as Apex user mode, and we will continue to ensure that going forward, all the most recent Apex features are also featured in PMD and therefore in Code Analyzer 2. In the next few months, we'll also aim to get our ID extension, the one you saw in Code Builder today, generally available. That means additionally supporting uh, ESLint, so our, our engine that we use to scan vulnerabilities in uh, Lightning Web Components, in uh, JavaScript, in TypeScript as well. We will have features such as automated scanning that will allow you to automatically scan a file within Code Analyzer whenever you save or whenever a change is made. And finally, an ability for you to easily suppress problems that you don't want to focus on at that particular point in time. And I'm also very happy to announce that we are working on the next generation of Code Analyzer, which will deepen our integration with Einstein for developers with the likes of uh, quick fixes. So imagine there's a problem in your code. We can use Einstein for developers to try to come up with a better version of your code that does not contain those particular problems. We are also going to deepen our integration with Scale Center and Apex Guru. And finally, we are going to make Code Analyzer much more customizable, meaning that you will ultimately get to the point of customizing it with your own um, engines, but also before that, customizing the likes of Graph Engine with your own rules, customizing severity levels, and being able to more granularly select which rules you want to follow and how do you want to organize your rules as part of your particular process with Code Analyzer. And finally, we will wrap everything up with a very user-friendly UX to help you guys out and get started with Code Analyzer. And with that, that's it for Jake and team. They're going to go ahead, deploy their changes, maintain them going forward, and we wish them all the best. And Ananya, I hear we have a guest today with us. Today to hear from me and John what our fictitious Jake would have been working on within his development life cycle. Why don't we hear from one of our very own customers, Alex Garcia, joining us from Anube Solutions, to hear what his experience has been like working with Einstein for Developers and Code Analyzer at his company. Let's welcome Alex. All right. Can you guys hear me? OK, they told me to use my outdoor voice. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm Alex Garcia. I am the CEO and founder of Anube Solutions. We are a consulting company that helps startups and enterprises implement cutting edge solutions that align technology to business process, um, basically doing digital transformations. Um, so here, happy to be here and to provide some real, real world examples as to how we use Code Analyzer and Einstein for developers. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience so far working with both of those tools? Absolutely. So when Einstein for Developers first came out, and I, and I want to preface by saying, in order to turn it on, you also have to give yourself the permission set and turn it on in any org that you're going to use Einstein for Developers. So I just saved you a couple of hours if you haven't turned it on yet. Um, and you a quick, quick update, we actually updated that flow so it'll now be on by default and you won't have to do that anymore. Awesome. All right, because I, I, you know, whatever everything you did just was very familiar. Um, as soon as, uh, Einstein for Developers came out. We started to test it to see what kind of code came out. Um, and you know, having to write prompts was a little bit um, skeptical of why we would have to write prompts. I thought that we have to get better at prompt writing because um, the AI lacked the ability to understand what we were asking it. And uh, you know, that's actually not true. And, and uh, after utilizing these code generation solutions, you come to realize that better prompt engineering is actually better for the entire world. It allows us not only to better communicate our requests, uh, but also to structure our requests in a way in which it makes sense from a human perspective, in a natural language perspective. You can communicate it better to your teammates, but also it makes sense for the large language models. And so um, you know, we matured our prompt writing and our prompt engineering capabilities uh, in order to better work with uh, the LLMs, um, and just hit the ground running utilizing uh, Einstein for developers, generating test code, um, and everything that you did on the screen seemed just incredibly familiar, just working within Code Builder and continuing to um, work with Code Analyzer as well to check our code and to make sure that we're only deploying the best code up to our clients' environments. Awesome. It's really great to hear that you've had a good experience working with both of those tools so far. Can you talk to us a bit about what made you choose Salesforce as your partner when we know there are so many other industry solutions available today? 
Yeah, and that's really that trust layer, right? And having the code generated by Salesforce from Salesforce, a lot of the times, and we tried other solutions, um, we found that the other solutions tend to hallucinate. They were creating fields that didn't exist as standard fields, and they were maybe taking something from like Microsoft Dynamics or something. Um, and, and so they were getting confused as to how to appropriately write and structure the code. And we were finding that, you know, as, as developers, it's kind of frustrating to get the wrong answer and having to fix it over and over again. We have juniors for that stuff, so we don't need uh, another uh, somebody to have to correct. And, and so working within the Salesforce uh, Einstein for developers, we get that assurance that the code that's being generated is up to Salesforce standards, up to Apex, and that it's not fake, right? That, we, that the code that we can generate there can be plugged right into um, our Apex, just like you did on the screen, and we have that trust that it's going to work. Awesome. That's really great to hear. Thank you so much for being with us today, Alex. Alex will be around after this if we want to ask him any other questions. In the interest of time, I will wrap this up now, but thank you so much for joining us. It's been great hearing about your experience. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Alex. All right, well, with that, we will go ahead and wrap this up. If you want to get started with Einstein for Developers, please take a moment to scan this QR code, and it'll bring you straight to our marketplace, where you'll be able to download Einstein for Developers for both Code Builder and VS Code. <laughs>